How's everyone doing today? Good. Most importantly, do we have a good time today? Yes. yes. Excellent. Who's ready to talk about Bitcoin? We won't be talking about Bitcoin, but we will be discussing blockchain. By a quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of the term blockchain? Everybody. How many of you understand the mechanics of blockchain? Okay, you want to, from 100 to 10 percent. <laughs> to keep up with the technological thought leadership here at RIT, I'll be discussing blockchain's effect on Web 3.0. To understand how we got here, let's begin with Web 1.0. With Web 1.0, we had static websites with little peer-to-peer -peer interaction. The data within those websites were stored in files. And we had our first technological disruption, email. With Web 2.0, we created more of a collaborative environment. And we were introduced to social media websites such as MySpace, Facebook, and YouTube. So who remembers MySpace? OK, a few of you. Quick history lesson. Back when I was in college, MySpace was the number one website in the US, and Facebook was only available to college students. Once Facebook was released to the masses, MySpace somewhat became an afterthought to the population. At the height of the organization, MySpace was valued at $12 billion. That's what it be. Fast forward to 2011, MySpace was sold to Justin Timberlake and a group of investors for just $350 million. So as a lesson to you future leaders out there, if your external environment is changing quicker than your internal environment, if you don't adjust to your surroundings, you may become MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> With Web 3.0, although there is no true definition as it's still developing, we're seeing the early stages of Web 3.0 with artificial intelligence, Google Home, and Amazon Alexa. We're also creating more of a secure, decentralized environment with blockchain. Although many associate blockchain with Bitcoin, blockchain is the underlying technology in which the Bitcoin cryptocurrency is built upon. To better understand blockchain, let's frame it like we're in the classroom and the professor is grading the final. Now, let's increase those number of professors to 10, 100, or 1,000 and they're distributed around the world. This demonstrates the decentralized nature of the blockchain that grows larger and more secure with time. Now, let's say that the professors are auditing those records and coming to a consensus. This increases the trust and validity in your answers or your transactions. Now let's say that a group of students know they didn't do so well on the final, and they wanted to hack or modify that block. They would have to have the computing power of Google in order to take over that particular block. Let's say that there's a discrepancy within a block for whatever reason. It's is it detectable, which translate to, translates to the immutability of the blockchain in that it cannot be changed or modified. Once all the transactions have been audited and approved, consensus is met, the block is created and written to the blockchain, transparent for everyone within that blockchain network. Now, although the previous scenario was an example, organizations and countries are making these capabilities a reality. And one of the most notable cases of blockchain within supply chain management, in an effort that would normally take them six and a half days, 
Walmart was able to recall one batch of mangoes in just 2.2 seconds. They were able to do this using a blockchain they created with, in, in collaboration with IBM. I'm going to repeat that. Six and a half days to 2.2 seconds. As a supply chain guy, that is Imagine if you could read a textbook in 2.2 seconds. You'd be pretty impressed, right? In one of the first cases of our federal government using blockchain, Catherine Holm shared in her TED Talk how she helped indict federal agents on fraud, extortion, and embezzlement using the transparent, immutable nature of the blockchain. At the state level, Ohio became the first state to allow organizations to pay taxes using the Bitcoin cryptocurrency. On an even larger scale, countries such as Ghana and the Republic of Georgia are embracing these blockchain technologies to track and trace land ownership within their communities. Also, countries such as Slovenia and Switzerland are looking to become blockchain nations as they're incorporating this technology within their future growth strategies. So with organizations and countries implementing these capabilities, the underlying question that still remains is, what about the people? How can this technology that the Harvard Business Review and Gartner referred to as an innovation that could potentially rival the internet, benefit us. Going back to the recent Russian hacking allegations in our last presidential election, what if we could vote for our next local or presidential election from the comfort of our homes? Through the use of public and private keys, we could encrypt our personal information, our voter registration, and our votes, and they can then be transmitted and transparent on a blockchain almost as soon as we cast our votes. Keeping with those public and private keys, what if we put the medical records into the hands of the patients themselves? This could mitigate the risks of patient medical errors that contribute to roughly 17 to $29 billion in costs and roughly 250,000 deaths each year. We can also use the blockchain to track and trace the pharmaceuticals that we consume to potentially mitigate the risk of counterfeit drugs entering our country. We could use the same blockchain concept to track and trace the foods that we consume from farm to grocery store. And through the use of smart contracts, which are self-executing contracts that execute based on predetermined rules, we can have our retirement accounts or our pensions automatically deposited into our bank accounts without intermediaries. This could mitigate the risk of human error. So, to further understand how the blockchain would work in certain environments, such as in a supply chain environment, one of my peers, Daniel Stanton, created this blockchain simulation tool in collaboration with the University of South Dakota and the Air Force Institute of Technology. In this example here, we are transferring ownership of an asset to the Department of Defense. This would be considered a permissioned blockchain, where only users with credentials to access the site could view these transactions. This would be applicable to our patient medical record example, as well as our retirement account example. Once again, once that transaction is initiated, those users or nodes are notified, they perform an audit on those transactions, consensus is met, and then that transaction is written to the blockchain. So all these transactions here could represent 
a block within a blockchain. Now imagine if these transactions were your full medical history. And this medical history could be transparent to all medical practitioners around the world. Let's say that you're, you're traveling in, on vacation in California and you need to go to an urgent care facility. You could have these transactions on your smartphone and that practitioner could have these transactions within their blockchain. Now imagine if these same transactions could save the lives of others. If practitioners used the blockchain as a knowledge base, they could use the filtering capabilities depicted here to search for similar symptoms and diagnoses to potentially save the lives of others. Now, we talk about permissioned blockchains, but now let's shift to a permissionless blockchain. A permissionless blockchain would be one that is viewable and transparent to everyone. This would be applicable to our voter example, as well as our tracking and tracing of pharmaceuticals. Now, let's imagine that we're on a plane <coughs> and you, or a loved one, has a peanut allergy. The flight attendant gives you a bag of cookies. You wonder if these cookies contain nuts. Using your blockchain application, you scan the quick response code or the barcode on these cookies and you're given the full history of all the ingredients within that bag of cookies. If you had these capabilities, would you feel more comfortable? No, that I would. One more time. Once the transactions are created and the users reach a consensus, that block is created to the chain, and what we have here is the blockchain. One of the most important pieces to the blockchain are the hashes that we have here expanded within this last block. The hashes within a block perform two different things. One, they encrypt that information that's linked to that particular block. And think of the hash like how we encrypt our credit card transactions. And two, the hashes create the glue or the link that keep the blockchain together. So as you can see, the current hash and the previous hash are linked within that particular block and the same holds true for all blocks within the blockchain. If there is a potential modification to those hashes, it's easily detectable, which is how the blockchain maintains its immutability and security. Now, we went through a number of, number of examples here, but we must share the knowledge of these capabilities outside of these four walls. Typically, when you're driving down the road and you see new construction, you wonder what's being built. You see the equipment, you see the resources, but really not much is happening. That's where we are with blockchain from a societal aspect. I ask for you to go to this link here and treat it like an ideation space. Think about the examples that we shared here today and think about how you can improve on them. Think about how you can take them further. If we do this, and we share our, our ideas, we can contribute to Web 3.0, and if we all do this as a collective, the sky's the limit to what we can build. Thank you. <laughs>